All right, so I'm going to draw a uh, simplified animal phylogeny um, just to show you here. These are at least currently all the different groups of animals, the different phyla, and um, we're just going to know some of them. And you can see the different characteristics here. I'll come back to a few of those. So uh, this branching pattern changes sometimes. But there are certain things that are consistent. So I will draw those and other things we will draw as polytomies because they're unclear or they're just too complicated for what we need to know for an intro bio class. Now, just remember that with a um, phylogeny, it's all about branching relationships. So I could draw this in a lot of different ways. Um, and I will have something where you're going to have to know how to you know, fill it out. Um, that would be on the final exam, not the animals two exam, but the final um, for this one. And, uh, you know, for example, this is the same thing as this, right? Which is the same thing as this. So it's all about the branching patterns. I just want to mention that so you don't get confused and think, oh, this is at the top and this one's at the bottom and this one's third from the top. No, that's not going to help you. You need to know, oh, this branch is off first and then this branch is off second and this is the last two to diverge, that sort of thing. And this one's in this group. I'm going to draw with a non-animal group, but that's in a pythoconce or pythoconce uh, that's most closely related to animals, but it's not an animal. Coanoflagellates. There are um, cell. They look similar to uh, certain types of sponge cells. They're sort of colonial organisms. Okay. I'm going to draw um, polytomy here for these three groups. Let's draw this. Okay, we'll leave it like that for a second. Okay, and then I'm going to draw letters instead of writing all the snake amorphies on here, although there's not that many, uh, or the groupings because it's just easier to um, keep it clean. So um, coanoflagellates are non-animals, so all the other ones on this group are going to be in metazoa. That's what M is. These first ones that I've drawn here, these first four groups, are the basal metazoans, meaning basal animals, meaning first di diverge. So it's not like they're worse or anything, or even necessarily simpler. There's plenty of, like, tapeworms are really simple. I mean, they have, like, no gut or anything, right, because they've lost it. Parasitic life allowed them to do that. But um, So it's not about simplicity per se, but it's about early origins, so or early diverge. So we've got this, the porifera, the sponges. We have the tenophora phylum, which is the comb jellies or tenophores. We have the placa zoa phylum, which is placozoans. And then we have the cnidaria, which are the cnidarians. Okay. Now I'll just go and we, uh, it's confusing about peripheral tenophora and placozoa, exactly how they branch and who's the first. Um, to, so I'm going to leave it like this. And Nidaria, it, there's better evidence to say that it's the sister group to bilateriates. That's what this group is here, all the bilateriates. Um, so I'm going to draw it like this, but all four of those are basal groups. I'm also going to put an E here, uh, or EU for eumetazoa. Tenophores also have some characteristics of eumetazoans as well. So I'm just going to go over here, and we'll write down what these things mean. So M means metazoa. And let's also um, have some vocab useful. So if you ever see zoa or zoo, it's going to mean animal um, or animal-like. Uh, if you see eu, it's true. You should know that from eukaryotes from bio one. Uh, just ps, if you see fight, that's plant or plant-like. Um, buy or die both mean two. Try means three. Uh, blast 
means germ. Germ means early. Um, development. It's not specialized or differentiated yet. Not specialized. We have arthro, and I emphasize this, arthro with an R. We'll tend to get that with mixed up with an N, but arthro means jointed or joints. If you can think of arthritis, probably know that word already, a disease of the joints. Um, we have pod or, and poda, which equals foot or foot-like. So you may know the doctor you go to if you have a foot problem. It's a podiatrist. These are just, you know, hints to help you remember. Uh, gastro means stomach. Cephalo means head. So gastro, like, for example, your gastrointestinal doctor, that's what GI means, or gastrointestinal tract. Yes. Cephalo means head. For example, um, you might have heard of encephalitis, which is like brain swelling. Um, you have deutero, which means second. Um, proto, which means first. You can remember that, like, prototype, first version of something. So those are some ideas that I had that could be useful um, for this unit. All right, so back to our metazoa. And meta means middle. Um, so it doesn't really matter for this purpose, but metazoa, zoa, here we go, we're animals. So metazoa means all animals. What are their synapomorphies or characteristics they share that define them? You may be surprised. Not movement, other organisms move. Not multicellularity. Not even muscles or nerves, although those are animal unique, but not all animals have them. So we're really just looking at a few characteristics. So certain types of tissue called epithelium that's like tissue that uh, lines the outside of organisms in a sheet um, and it has particular junctions so epithelium itself is not unique but the epithelium with certain cell junctions meaning connections between the cells. So those junctions are uh, gap junctions, tight junctions, and then desmosomes. Those are animal specific. You can actually look those up in chapter four if you wanna see what they are for. But overall, this kind of stuff uh, is going to allow the multicellularity and the communication between cells Gap junctions in particular are uh, involved with neurons. Those are important things for animal um, to be able to do. And then collagen is an animal specific. All animals have collagen, which is part of the extracellular matrix, which is an animal thing. Outside of the cell membrane, gives some strength as well as communication, helps the uh, cells can stick together as well. So those are the two really special animal things. Now, like I said, though, we get to the eumetazoa, and it has the other two animal-specific features. True nervous and muscle tissue. These are only in animals, really important. Eumetazoa also has Hox genes, which we don't see in all the other groups. 
Okay, so if we go with porifera, the sponges, definitely no true tissue. Do have specialized cells, though, that do work together. No true tissue, so it's definitely not in your metazoa. It has variable symmetry, asymmetry. As in, sometimes they could be bilaterally symmetrical species. There's some that are radially symmetrical. There's some that are asymmetrical. So we can't say that that's consistent. Placozoa are asymmetrical. Nidaria and Tinophora, and this does include Tinophora, even though I didn't, um, it's not actually closely as closely related to Nidarians as they probably are to bilaterians, but they both definitely have true nervous tissue and muscle. But uh, it's different than bilaterians, we'll see. But they're, so they're, nerve uh, net so that's how their nervous tissue is so it's not um there's no brain or anything it's basically distributed throughout the body there are other species with nerve nets that are probably secondarily derived in other groups there is some centralization like sensory structures like in box jellies cubozoans that allow them to do better hunting than other cnidarians but generally we're looking at nerve net and we're looking at a uh, simple muscle it is muscle tissue, but it's simple muscle. It's primarily ectoderm derived. As far as I know. And the important thing about ectoderm is that cnidarians and tenophores are uh, diploblasts or diploblastic. Di meaning two, blast meaning germ. So they have two germ layers during development, two layers that differentiate into all the other tissues and the very specific, like they consistently turn into different tissues. So one is what I just mentioned up here, the ectoderm, and the other one is the endoderm that turns into the gut. Um, and then they're also radially symmetrical, which means that, you know, they're like a, a circle. You can cut them in all different directions and they're symmetrical no matter which direction you cut them in as in you could fold it in half and they'd be the same. There's a top and a bottom. There's no front, back, left, right, back, belly. Just a clade, by meaning two. Why is it named that? Uh, it's first synapomorphy, which is the bilateral symmetry, or at least at some point in its life. Um, some groups like echinoderms, which are like sea stars and such, they lose their uh, bilateral symmetry and most of them become radially symmetrical as adults. But let's just say this is like a planarian, you can see that if I split it, we would have a left side and a right side. But if I split it um, across this way, then, and you try to fold it, the head and the tail are not the same. And this is a whole thing. It's starting to differentiate the head and the tail. So the head region is called the anterior. The tail is the posterior. That left and right sides, the back is called the dorsal. And then the belly is called the ventral side. So it's supposed to be like projecting into, <laughs> into the screen. Okay. It's one bilateral characteristic. The other one is instead of being diploblastic, it's triploblastic, which means it has three germ layers. They are the ectoderm, same as before, the endoderm, same as before, but then the other layer is the mesoderm or mesoderm. And um, endoderm is where the gut and other organs, but primarily gut, this is uh, ectoderm is the central nervous system. And we're looking at the skin, mesoderm, big one is muscles. That's where the mesoderm, and they're very well-developed muscles, at least compared to non bilaterates well-developed. Okay, the third characteristic that they have is cephalization. Kind of goes along with bilateral symmetry. So basically that means the nerves collect at anterior as in they now have like a head. So you get something like a brain or 
ganglia. You can get a central nervous system completely. And you've got nerve cords and such. Why is this advantageous? It allows um, more sophisticated sensory structures. If you think about where all our senses are, pretty much uh, you're thinking in our head, right? Also the ability to process sensory stimuli. And how is that advantageous? One of the things it allows is directional movement. For the most part, jellyfish don't move in a certain direction. They don't like swim towards prey or anything. They kind of just, they, they do the bell thing and they float along, but it's really, there's no like forward for them. There is no forward. Uh, so this directional movement has two kind of major advantages. It allows them to be better predators uh, and it also allows them to be better at not being prey because they can like swim in a certain direction away and detect the sensory structures, detect their prey and detect their predators so they can avoid uh, being caught as well. So those are some advantages of the directional movement and sensory structures, which are all allowed by cephalization. That's our B for bilateria. We've got three major groups and I could draw these in uh, top to bottom, any kind of order, remember it's just branching, but one of the groups to branch off by itself, I'm gonna label with the D here, that's the deuterostomia group, that's animals too. So those are the chordates or chordata is the phylum. We have the echinodermata. And we have the hemichordata, or the acorn worms. Okay. Then we have two other groups here, and I'm uh, just going to draw them. Now, uh, also, when I draw this, where I draw the branching relative to each other, um, let me do a better job here. So the fact that I draw this branch after that branch, that is real. So that means that echinodermata and hemichordata they separated after chordates branched off. So that's a real branching pattern. But the fact that I'm drawing this branch back here for these other groups versus the deuterostone branch there, that is not a real timeline. So it's all just relative time and it's really a cladogram, not really a phylogeny, because that does not mean this branching happened before this branching of chordates off. Okay, so just don't, um, be misled by that. But I can say there's there's two groups here. One group, I'm just gonna do a massive polytomy. I'm gonna put seven. And then the other group, I'm just gonna go with three. There are more groups in both of these. These colors are picked from I, um, a palette that is supposed to be colorblind friendly. So if even if you can't see the colors that I'm using, you're not really missing a lot of information. But just to let you know, hopefully you can at least distinguish between those colors. Okay, so what groups do we have here? We have, uh, I'm going to draw SP slash L, um, Spiralia slash Lophotrochozoa, naming is unclear because we don't know the branching in here completely. Um, I see both in the literature. And then the Echidicezoans, which are this group I'm drawing with that down here. So we'll put the Arthropoda, or the arthropods, jointed appendages. R, R, not an N, an R. <laughs> okay. Um, tardigrada. Tardigrades or water bears, those are the ones that can survive in like crazy conditions like vacuums and without water for centuries or something crazy like that. Um, and then nematoda, roundworms. Okay, those are the deuterist, uh, excuse me, the um, ichthyosome groups that I'm going to worry about. And then let's do these groups here. Spiralia. These are in no particular order. Mollusca. Uh, 
Somebody how mint these. Mollusca or mollusks. Ladiomenthes of flatworms. And Alita, segmented worms. Bryozoa slash ectoprocta. Same thing. They are also known as moss animals, or colonial, with little lophophores or little tentacles that are ciliated. Um, they stick out, so it sort of looks like moss. It's a big colony in a sort of solid exoskeleton structure. Each of them has their own little hole in there. Then we have the lamp shells, or the brachiopoda. Brachio means arm, and so it's like arm foot. These are the ones that look like a clam on a stick. <laughs> This is a stalk that's attached usually with like a, a shell on top of it that looks like a bivalve, but it's not actually a bivalve. Um, then what else am I looking at? Uh, I put this in our, our notes. So Nimertia or the uh, ribbon worms. And then some of the stuff I have written, rotifera or rotifera, syndermata is, is really probably the phylum. The important ones, there's only two groups in the phylum, rotifers. And then this other one, I can't remember the name right now, uh, micronathozoa. There you go, I believe. Micronathozoa is basically a parasite that's highly uh, modified uh, that turns out to be highly closely related to rotifers. So they're in syndermata. The rotifers are the ones that are useful to know there. Okay. These three, um, these are bilaterian subgroups. And you know, clade just means monophyletic group. Subclades. There may be a couple other ones, maybe one other early branching one, a little bit unclear, but these are the basic groups. Uh, these are in large part based off of DNA sequencing. Uh, it's difficult because some groups like platyhelminthes evolve very quickly. So their genome looks a lot more different than it it is time-wise, and so there's, it's, sometimes they only have like one, a couple species of these organisms, which makes it difficult to do DNA analysis, but this, to the best of our knowledge, this is the grouping. Very consistently, Deuterostomia tend to come together, very consistently do ectisozoans. Spiralia has some uh, variability in how those groupings go. Like this, the Deuterostomia, that was the D. Deuter. Stoma, you can add that to your list. Stoma means mouth. So deuterostomia means the second mouth, which basically means that the mouth is uh, the blastopore in development turns into the anus, not the mouth. Although I've been looking into this and it's all kinds of complicated about who has deuterostome development, who has protostome development. And then on top of that, it's like, even if you have the protostome type cleavage of spiral cleavage, then it's not even necessarily correlated with your blastopore developing into a mouth, it's really wild. And so it, I was trying to get, you know, like a, a simplified version of it together, but it's, it's highly varied. What I can tell you is all of deuterostomia have deuterostome type development. Classic deuterostome type development, which basically what's going to mean the blastopore becomes the anus, which is not like, I don't know why people think that means your mouth is your anus, but that's not right. It just means that that first opening ends up being the anus, and then a second opening that uh, arises is the mouth. Um, they all have radial cleavage. In the embryonic development, and they have indeterminate cleavage. Indeterminate cleavage, meaning that you can take out a cell and the rest of the embryo, early enough, you can take out a cell and the rest of the embryo will still be okay. Uh, sometimes you can also take out that cell and, and it'll divide and it'll become its own new, new organism. So indeterminate means that those cells have some flexibility at early stages still. Then our other two groups, uh, yeah. And I'm not even going to worry about putting protostomes or protostomia because that is like a kind of useless name now. 
that we understand a lot more about how development really works. You know, because before we didn't have imaging, like now we have such good imaging with microscopes, being able to take movies and do all these three-dimensional, four-dimensional, meaning time involved um, movies of things we can really track with computer programs. Every cell from the beginning of when it exists to like where it goes in the adult, um, how it divides every direction, which cells die. It, 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 and sometimes that's very consistent in organisms. Sometimes it's variable between individuals. But this is compared to what we used to do when it was like basically, you know, you just took a picture um, or you just observed it under the microscope even before you could take pictures. And that's just seeing a snapshot in time. Right. And also some of the techniques we used before squished the organisms um, underneath cover slips uh, or stuff like that. So it's basically you're not allowing the physics to happen because if you squash it, it puts different pressures on the cells, which means that the uh, cytoskeleton behaves differently, which means cells divide differently and, and, and then they would normally. So, you know, we found out that there's a lot of that going on, but um, it's one of the things that's really fun about new technology is that we find out new things. Ecdysozoa, uh, ecdysis is shedding. So these mostly do shed, although that is really not a great, or molt, we could say. It's not a great like characteristic though. I can say, None have spiral cleavage. And they either have radial cleavage or variable <laughs> cleavage, some other version of radial. Um, so none with the spiral cleavage, though. It's not really a characteristic that is shared. But in Spiralia or Lophotrochozoa, we'll see how those names work out. Most have spiral cleavage, though there's variations. Maybe I just say many have spiral cleavage. The thought is maybe that the ancestral, um, the ancestor of all spiralia had spiral cleavage and then some of these lost it. I was originally thought protostome development was first and then deuterostome development was second, but it looks like perhaps the Bilateriate that gave rise to all the other bilateriates was deuterostome type development and then the, the protostome with the spiral cleavage and the mouth coming um, from the blastopore might have happened second. It's confusing too because a lot of these develop without a blastopore really. So it's like you can't even say the blastopore turns into anything because there is no blastopore. They're working on it. Let's just add in here highly varied development mental uh, patterns. So it should be pretty easy now to look at this phylogeny. And if you've drawn this on you know, your own notes, instead of just looking at this video, and then you have all this stuff written to the side of what they, the, the word, the letters mean. So it's really easy to look at. And I ask you like, okay, is, is Mollusca a bilateriate? You just go, boom, bilateriate, yes. Is it Eumetazoan? Yes. Is it metazoan? All of them, yes. Um, is it dysozoan? No. Um, so it should be easy now to be able to do that. So I hope that helps.